Good morning, City Life. Good morning, City Lifers and visitors. Welcome to church. Glad that you're here. Welcome. Welcome to City Life. Um, my name is Pedro Reese, and I'm the lead pastor here. It's my utmost privilege to bring us the word again this week. And uh, last week, we started a two-week look, a two-part sermon through the book of Esther. I would, if it was up to me, I would stay in Esther for a very long time. And maybe one day down the line we will, because Esther is an amazing story. But our big question from last week was, what happens when God cannot be found and all you can see is the enemy's plan? Like that, last week I came and I started us off and I just was overwhelmed with the mess in the world with human brokenness, with our condition, with each and with me, like, I was just overwhelmed. And I know the right answers, like, I've built my whole life on the right answers about Jesus. But I just, like, what happens when everything just feels like a mess? What happens when, like, God seems lost? What happens in seasons of doubt? And we have no idea how he's going to make everything right. Like, how is life done when we have the right answers, but we don't feel them in our bones? We don't live like we know the right answers. Because, and we, like, we just know that we just like, are unconvinced. What happens in those seasons? What happens when we think, like, are we just too broken right now? Is humanity too unredeemable right now? Like, is God's story good up until a point and then we're just too broken, even for Him? I was wrestling with a lot of these questions in the face of everything that we see going around globally in the U.S., around us, in my own heart, in my own mind. But it's exactly at these moments that I know, that I know that I know that God has kept the, His stories and has told stories like Esther. I like I'm convinced that it is for moments exactly like this when God tells us to go to Esther. Because Esther is a powerful story of how God is at work, always turning the enemy's plans upside down even when we cannot see him. Esther is this beautiful and powerful story of things that we, well, fancy words like, well, it's not that fancy, but words like ironic reversals and divine coincidences. It's like this story of God on display, turning everything that was meant to harm us to do good for us. Everything that was meant to harm us to be the exact mechanisms of what is good for us. And so last week we opened the story and we covered every, pretty much everything. We kind of covered the narrative up till all of chapter 4. And just to recap, if you weren't here with us last week, Esther is this amazing story. It starts with parties, big parties. The king of Persia was throwing these banquets. It lasted 180 days, 180 days of drinking and partying and having a good time, right? Everyone who worked for him, it was their job to party with him for 180 days. And some, at some point in this 180-day festival, the king called his queen, Queen Vashti, to come to him because like, all the queen was good for was for people to see how beautiful she was. And so he calls her to go there, and she does what nobody does to this king. She says no, refuses to come, and she gets demoted, no longer queen. And the king starts this like, nationwide, empire-wide beauty pageant to find his next queen, to find who is beautiful. And we are introduced to a little girl, a little Jewish girl. Well, she's, oh gosh, a little, gosh, no, she wasn't like a child. Maybe to our sense, but gosh, like, I'm getting carried away. We're introduced to this lady. Her name is Hadassah. Her Jewish name is Hadassah, but she goes by Esther. And if it turns out, it just so happens that Esther is beautiful, drop-dead gorgeous. And the story, Esther's story, is that she's put in front of the right person. She finds favor. She's like always being elevated at the exact right time because of her looks. And so we're introduced to this Jewish girl, this Hebrew girl named Esther, and her adopted father named Mordecai. 
And everywhere that Esther goes in the story, every time she's brought forth, she's accepted. She finds favor. She's elevated. She's put in the advantageous spots. And it keeps on going like this, but she has a secret. So she, Mordecai, her stepdad, tells her not to tell anyone that she's Jewish. And so eventually she's put in front of the king, and the king is absolutely smitten by her, and he makes her his new queen. He's just like so wiped away by her beauty. She becomes the new queen. And then it just so happens, last week one of the things we talked about is if Esther was written in today's vocabulary, the phrase, and then, like, it just so happened would be the like, perfect one. All of these coincidences lining up right next to each other. It just so happens that Mordecai, her adopted father, goes to one of the city gates and he's hanging out there and he hears these two guards, a eunuch guards, talking about killing the king. And Mordecai tells Esther, Esther tells the king, they investigate, find that it's legitimate, and they take these two men and they kill them. And Mordecai gets the credit. It just so happens that stuff like just works out that way in the story. But then we're introduced to the bad guy, Haman. Haman is of Canaanite descent. Haman is made into the second most powerful person in all of the kingdom. And the king not only makes him the second most powerful person, but he wants to show him respect and honor. He says, anyone who comes into Haman's presence needs to bow to him. The only person in the empire who would not bow to him was the king himself. Everyone needed to. But it just so happened that Mordecai could not get himself to bow down to Haman. Haman finds out. Haman puts into motion this plan to kill all the Jews. He's like, okay, Mordecai's Jewish. We're going to kill all the Jewish people in the kingdom. And they come up with a plan. He makes a decree. He has the king sign it. On the 13th of Adar, all the Jews in the Persian Empire are going to be killed. Set into motion. It's law decreed by the king. And so then the story continues. Mordecai and Esther start exchanging notes to one another, exchanging texts via messengers. It's very funny. And Mordecai asks her the most famous question in the whole story of Esther. If anyone knows anything about Esther, it is chapter 4, verse 14. He says to her, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Coincidentally, interestingly, God's name is not mentioned once in the book of Esther. He's not mentioned at all. He's not spoken to. They don't pray to him. They don't go to him. He doesn't speak. He doesn't zap into the story. He's not mentioned at all. And he's here he's asking, like, who knows, Esther? Maybe everything that has happened has happened for a reason. He doesn't even mention God, but he's like, who, who knows? Maybe all of these coincidences aren't coincidences after all. Maybe you're exactly where you are for a reason. Let's find out. And the story continues. Esther is going to go before the king to try and save herself and all of the Jewish people. She says, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die, because it was illegal for anyone, even the queen, to go to the king unannounced. But they're like, okay, go fast. We talked about this last week. I highly suggest you listen to last week's uh, sermon. And then we get to today's portion of the story. And there's only one thing, we're going to read from chapter 6, uh, a couple chapters forward. There's only one piece of detail that we need to know, that we need to have in our head as we go into where we're going to read from today. We're going to read from chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. You can turn it there, it'll be on the screen as well. But the one thing that happens right before this that we need to have in our brains as we read our text for today is that one morning Haman is going out of his house, he's going to work, right? He's just in a really good mood, it says. It says that he's very joyful that morning up until he sees Mordecai. And Mordecai, it says here, he, is, he neither rose nor trembled before him. He didn't give him the respect that he was deserved. And Haman is instantly, it says, he's instantly filled with wrath against Mordecai. He's just not having it. Chapter 5, verse 9, he's just not having this. And he goes home. He, gets, he gathers his wife. His wife is there, and some of his friends come over. And they're just like tossing around ideas, right? And it's just like really casual. Like, imagine this happening. His wife turns to him and says, Let a gallow 50 cubits high be made. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. Right? It's like, oh, it's like, just, I have an idea for you. Let's set up a 50 cubit gallow. Uh, the English here is not so certain. Some people think it's a gallow to be hung, and some people, because of the Hebrew, 
think that it's a spike, a, a stake to be impaled on. I happen to think that it's most likely a stake to be impaled on. But this is the idea. But no matter which device it is, it's like, okay, you know, let's set up a 50, a 50 cubit high gallow. Right? A, 50, a 50 cubit high hanging device or a 50 cubit high stake. And then tomorrow you can go and have them killed. Right? 50 cubits is about 75 feet. Like this, they're not joking around. They're just like, oh, you know what? Have, have the soldiers put in our backyard a 50 foot, a 75 foot stake. And tomorrow we'll just go and ask the king to put him out, just like impale him on it, to hang him on it, right? You know, just like casual. Let's just put this up in our backyard. Nobody will notice. And then it just so happens that they've put this plan into motion. And it just so happens that the king can't get any sleep. And this changes the story from here on out. Let's read Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. This is the word of the Lord. This is Esther's story told by God himself. It says this, On that night the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had, ta had told about Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? And we'll stop right there for now. Let's pray. Let's pray before we keep going. Lord, I thank you for this day. And I thank you, Lord, that you have told stories like Esther's of when we don't feel you or see you and we feel like the world is in too much of a mess, that you're still at work. That you are able to turn the, every plan of the enemy upside down. That everything that was meant for evil, you can use for good that you are sovereign and big enough to do all of these things, that you are much bigger than us and you see the beginning to the end. And so, Lord, uh, Holy Spirit, I invite you here now uh, into the hearing of your word to put something in our souls that will give us the courage and the boldness and the determination to see that out in our lives, that you can turn every plan of the enemy upside down and save your people, no matter what. And uh, I thank you. Holy Spirit, you're invited here. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start our sermon talking about the most ordinary. And so the story continues, and we get here to what we're reading today. And up until now in this story, we've only seen the problem, right? We've only seen the beginning, the escalation, the forming of the enemy's plan in the story of Esther, right? It's only been a downhill slope from here. It's only been the formation of the problem of what God needs to undo now, of like, what if God is around, what can he do in the face of all of this mess? But at this point, we start to see God's plan forming, right? It's like we say it's God, right? The story doesn't mention him. He's not mentioned in here. That's a big part of the story. But our first point for today is that God's sovereignty is often at work in the most ordinary ways. In the most ordinary of people, in the most ordinary of things, and in the most ordinary feeling moments, God can be at work. We often think of being like spiritual attune, attuned means that like we are looking out for these big moments of like that burning bush or that flaming mountain or like <laughs> any flaming mountain. I made that one up. Shoot. But anything big, we like look for these grand things. But often God is found in all of the most ordinary of moments in all of the most ordinary of ways. The king couldn't sleep this night and Esther and all the Jews in the kingdom were saved. Right? In this story, it just so happens that in between uh, Haman wanting to, setting up a stake and wanting to kill Mordecai, and like from today, it just so happens that the king couldn't fall asleep. It just so happens that he needed a bedtime story and he asked for the king's chronicles to be read to him. And it just so happens that a sleepless night saved an entire people. 
right? He reads the story, or actually the story is read to him, and he remembers of what Mordecai did for him, and he asks them the second most important question in the whole story. is like, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Right? In the mix of all the partying and all of that, he just forgot. And nothing was done for Mordecai to thank him for what he did. And he asks, what has been done? And they say to him, nothing. We often make Esther and Mordecai the heroes of the story, which like, as Christians, we tend to do that. Like, we tend to romanticize everything. But really, Esther is a story of God working through compromised people. Right? Esther and Mordecai... They, they weren't like, they, sure, they played a role and they were brave and they stood up in the face of all of this, but they, they were doing things that like Jewish people should not have been doing. They hid that they were Jewish. Esther was promoting people getting drunk and she was sleeping with someone who wasn't Jewish and who like technically wasn't her husband all the way all, yet. And it's like all of these things were happening. We make them the heroes, but like we often forget that God is at work and the king couldn't fall asleep that night. And because God's not mentioned in the story, we're here left to decide for ourselves. We are here to wrestle with questions like this. Esther is designed for us to ask questions like, man, could God have been doing this? Could the king's sleepless night be God's work? Could God move this plainly? Like, could he do this such an ordinary way, right? We expect chariots of fires or like signs, or more plagues like in Egypt, like could, or could he just work through a king's sleepless night? And our first point for today, like what I really want us to hear in Esther's story, is that when we're living in a messy world and it seems as though God cannot be found, God is often at work in the most ordinary of things. And that means that every moment of our lives is at his disposal. Right? Don't ever think that anything in life, any activity, anything, any person, any moment is too ordinary for God to use to his plan because God works through many ordinary ways. And so God, if he works through the ordinary, can work through you. Like if God is a God who moves through the ordinary, your life, your being, every moment of your life is at his disposal for him to use to make his plan come according to his will. Like if God can use you, then he can use a walk in the park. He could use a grocery store run for eternal purposes. He can use a Sunday morning. He could use a random encounter. Seeing somebody on the path, he can use a surprise call. He can nudge you to text somebody. He can bring a stranger in your way. He can even bring somebody when we're at church to walk across the sidewalk and see our sign and come in and hear about Jesus. Like if God can use the ordinary, he can use any of this. All of this is up for his use. That nothing is too ordinary. Meaning you, like some of us are like, God doesn't use me. He cannot use me. I'm just me. Like, no, like if he has called you, if you have said yes to him, there's someone else in this world who is depending on you to bring them Jesus. God works through all of the ordinary moments. No moment is off limits when a full life is devoted to God. And when you find those moments, trust me, you do not want any moment to be off limits Because it is those moments when you see something divine happening in an ordinary moment that saves your heart and you realize that God is at work, not just in reading stories or hearing other people talk about it, but you get to see Him working yourself, working through you the most ordinary of things. It changes your life forever. Our first point for today is that God can use a king's sleepless night to save a whole people, His people his chosen people. And the second part of the story that I want to pull out to us is that this is the center of the story. So the story continues from here on out, and the king finds out that nothing has been done to honor Mordecai, to thank him, to show him honor. Like The one thing about this king that we have seen is that he is okay with sharing honor, right? So many kings are greedy and selfish with it, but you know, he elevates Haman. He tells everyone to bow to him. He also wants to do good by Mordecai because Mordecai saved his life here. And then he asks the question, who is in the court? And that's where we stopped reading. And the story continues. 
He's like, who is here? Because I need to do something about this. And because Esther is a story about it, and it just so happened, and it just so happened that when he asks this, Haman is walking in. Haman is walking into his job. He's ready to clock in. And remember, he is there in that moment to ask the king to kill Mordecai on the stake or the gallow that he's put up in his backyard. He is there for one purpose. He's going to ask the king to kill Mordecai for him. And before he can get it out, the king steps in in that moment and he asks him a question. He asks him, in chapter 6, verse 6, he says, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman, being a typical self-centered person, thinks that this question is about him. He sa it says in, in chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Haman says to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Right? It's his, an internal monologue. He's like, oh, like he's, ask, he's asking me what he should do for me because who would he want to show honor more than he would want to show honor to me? And so because Haman's ego is super inflated in that moment, he spares no expense he turns to the king, he's like, king, like, I got a perfect idea, man. This is what you should do. You should put royal robes on this person, right? But not just any, like, don't get a tailor to make something. Give this person something that you yourself have worn. Give it to this person to ride it, to wear it. And then, like, put that person with those robes on a royal horse. And not just any horse, right? Not just one of, in your stable, but a horse that you have ridden on. And then, you know what, just stop it all off. Let's put a crown on him. Put a crown on him. Have his head gleaming like a king. And then he said, but let's not stop there. After, all, after we do all of this, get one of your most noble officials. He said, he like specifically says, one of your most noble officials and have this official take the reins of the horse and walk him around town. And as they're doing this, right, it's like not, that's not good enough yet. As they're walking around, have this official say to everyone, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor, right? Parade him around the whole town and tell everyone that this person is special and that the king loves to show honor to this person, right? I, the one thought that I had when I was like thinking about this is, I, I don't know if any of our younger people are going to get this, but there's a song, it's called You're So Vain by Carly Simon. And then this song, in the chorus, she says over and over again, she says, you probably think this song is about you, don't you, don't you, don't you, right? Uh, the background of that story is that her producers were trying to get her to sound more pop. And she was just refusing and refusing and refusing. And in her frustration, she wrote this song about her executives who were forcing her to sound different. And it turned into her biggest hit in her whole career, right? So it's pretty funny. The song about her executives, making fun of her executives, turned out to be her most famous song. But the same idea is here. Heyman's like, oh my goodness, like he's asking me what he should do for me. And so let me make this pretty big. Let me make this pretty grand. And if I could have just been a fly in the room when the king looks at him and says, I love this plan, let's do this plan, go get a horse and do all of these things for Mordecai. Like, oh my, if I, uh, I, I am pretty sure he would have hid it from his face, right? Because it, the shock would have been so great. Haman was there to ask the king to kill Mordecai. And in that exact moment, the king tells him to show honor to Mordecai, the person he was trying to kill. Like, is that not a, an ironic reversal or like, oh my goodness, the shock on this man's inside. Like, man, I wish we could have gotten more internal dialogue here. But like, no, God is at work reversing the plans of the enemy. And I, I just love how this story goes and how this story is shaped. And actually, this is perfect because it serves as the central moment in Esther's story. I'm, we're going to throw a graphic up here. I'm not going to talk about it too much for the sake of time. But Esther is designed in a way that like, it is perfectly symmetrical. And this point here is the center of the story. Up until now, there have been feasts, there has been scheming, there have been plans of the enemy. And then God starts to reverse the whole story of Esther. Leading up to this moment, everything starts to shift and change towards what God wants to do. 
That graphic, by the way, is, is made by the, the Bible Project. I love them. Check out their videos, any of their content, but it is so good. This is the exact center of the story, and it is so perfect this way. It's like when God starts to display that he is turning the plans of the enemy upside down, this man had a 75-foot stake installed in his backyard to kill Mordecai, and in the moment that he was going to ask the king to do it for him, he is stuck parading that same man around the town showing him honor. And for us today, in this story of when it seems like, man, this is all just upside down, everything is like evil is going to win out. Let me speak this into your life today. Let Esther speak this into your life in a new way. That when all seems lost and God cannot be found, he's still at work to turn the plans of the enemy upside down for the sake of his people. Like God is uniquely able to turn everything that any one of us and our enemy, the, the enemy of his kingdom, upside down. This isn't a promise that your whole life is going to be great. That there's nothing going to, like, there's no obstacle, that there's nothing you're going to have to overcome. Like, no, it's like actually quite the opposite, right? Bad things will come. Here, their threat, like, this was the moment that his life was going to end. And God only turned it around at the, like, last moment possible. But he did it. And so in the face of struggle, when life is too much, when like we really cannot, <laughs> it's just too much, God will turn every plan of the enemy upside down. And that leads us exactly into our last point of well, looking into Esther and calling it meant for evil, used for good. And so the story continues. After the parade, he, Haman rushes home. Mordecai goes to one of the city gates and Haman rushes home, and his wife and his friends are there. And they give him advice, but this time he does, like, does not want to hear it. And then the guards come because he has a feast with the king and with Esther afterwards. And he always knew, like, their plan was go in the morning and ask him, and then from there you can go and enjoy the party. Like, go and enjoy the feast with the king and, and, queen, the, king and the queen, right? Such so he think he's gearing himself ready for this, like, special feast with the two most important people in the kingdom. And he's like, he's trying to get handle his business before he can, so he can go and enjoy it. But then they come, and the feast happens, and in chapter 7 of Esther, the king turns to his new queen, and he's like, what do you want? Up till half of my kingdom, I'll give it to you. What do you want? And in chapter 7, starting in verse 3, this is what she asks for. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Ugh, like, this hits. This is a one bad day for Haman. It's actually going to be his last day, but we'll talk about that in a second. It's like this story, I just like, imagine in that moment, this queen standing up and saying, like, king, like, my people are going to die, and we've been sold to die. And the king's like, who is this? And she points to the only other person receiving this feast. And he had no idea that she was Jewish. Like, he, had, he would have not had any way to expect this at all. This is like movie-type reveals, right? This is like a movie-type cliffhanger. And he, she points to him and is like, this wicked man, Haman, and the king loses it. Right after this, something really important happens. Uh, one of the guards there, his name is Habona. Like, he just steps in and he talks. We don't re even really know why. This seems out of place. But he says, Moreover, the gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai, 
whose words saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. Like Harbona, Harbona stands up here just to say, like, actually, king, you know what? He also set up this stake to kill Mordecai, the person that you made him honor today. And like, oh, what I want to pull, that from, for, pull out from there in this story of like how God is orchestrating all of these things, the lessons for us to take here is first that Haman's evil gave him away. And in the end, all evil always gives people away. That evil, like, Haman could have even tried to talk his way out of it. Until this guard stands up and says, actually, you know what? There's like a 75-foot stake in this man's yard to kill Mordecai. And it's like, well, like, how could he talk a way out of that one? What words in the world would have undone this 75-foot stake in his backyard to kill Mordecai? Like evil always gives people away. The things that we do will always give us away when we participate with evil. And then the other thing, and like more importantly, more beautifully to me, is also this, that what Haman had built to kill Mordecai was what turned out to be Haman's own death. From here, the king is enraged, and he tells his guards to impale him, to hang him, whatever it is, whatever the mechanism is. What he put up to kill Mordecai ended up being what killed him. Like what the enemy meant for harm saved God's people. The lesson here is that when God is at work, the exact thing that meant to kill us sometimes is what brings us our redemption in the first place. That when God is at work, he not only turns the plans of the enemy upside down, but it like what was meant for evil often becomes what serves us good. Esther is this incredible story of how God works through all of our mess, at times undetected by us. And somehow he is like able to turn around everything that was meant to be contrary to him and his people. God is able to work through our mess. Uh, when evil seems too much, or when it seems like there's no way out, God can still turn things around. And that is the hope of all people for all times. And so let's conclude this a little bit, shall we? Esther is this powerful story, unique in all of Scripture, of ironic reversals, of divine coincidences, of things happening at all of the right moments, even though God is not mentioned once in this whole story. And it's this beautiful story that causes us to wrestle. Can God really still do this? Like, is there ever any amount of evil that He can't undo? Oh, when we think that He is nowhere and we can't see what He's doing, can He still turn this around? And the answer that this story gives us is an emphatic yes. And He does it perfectly. He does it at the right moment. He does it according to his plan in his timing. God can turn everything that the enemy meant upside down. And oftentimes exactly what the enemy set up is what he was going to use anyway. He's like, God is the only one who's big enough to bring redemption through all of it. To save his people in the face of all of our mess and the enemy's plan. He is like the only one who can do that. And I also want us to end Esther looking at it from this way. It just so happened that the exact thing happened to Jesus. It just so happened that Esther is a foretaste of what Jesus was going to do. That Satan, God's wicked enemy, that the religious order who is trying, who is starving to kill Jesus, they put him on a tree, they put him on a cross to die, to end his story, to end it right there, that he like should not be breathing anymore. But it turned out that that cross was exactly where Jesus intended to be. 
and would not be the end of his story. It just so happened, like in Esther, that that tree is not our shame, but where we first live. Right? It just so happened that every plan that Satan had to end Jesus' life, to end what he was going to accomplish here, was the exact thing that Jesus was marching towards. And he could not see it, just like we cannot see it when we only look at the mess, when we only look at our sin, when we only see how broken all of this are, and we're like, God, how can you make a way? Like what Jesus did on the cross is exactly what is set up in Esther. That God knows how to take us out no matter how much the mess seems to be big. That often the things that were meant for our harm, right? The stake that Haman put up for Mordecai turned out to be the stake that killed himself. The tree, the cross that Satan set up for Jesus happened to be where everyone who is saved is saved. Where everyone finds the Savior, kneels at his the place that he died, only to be brought to life for the first time. And so, church, if our whole look into Esther was about looking, can God overturn all of this? Can he do something about all of our brokenness? And also, more importantly, can he like stand up to Satan and the effects of sin and the brokenness that even I know I have inside of me? And the answer is yes. Esther shows us how God turns the plan of the enemy upside down. The perfect moments and the most like beautiful reversals. And then on the cross, the place that meant to kill Jesus was the place that he was always marching towards. And so God can turn around the plans of the enemy. And he does that on a cosmic scale and he does it on a you, individual, intimate scale. He's good at handling all of those and at every level. And so God can save you. He can bring you into a new season of life. He can redeem you, everything that is wrong and broken in your life, your work, your marriage, your relationships, you feeling lost, you feeling dead, you feeling numb, like you not having any hope for the future to get any better. God can do something about it. Just like we are trusting that he will have something to to do about sin, murder, death, injustice, everything that we talked about last week. And so, church, when you see when you have no hope, turn to Esther, and see how God provides for His people, and He makes a way to end the enemy's plan. So, thank you, God, for stories like Esther. Thank you for speaking that much life into our lives. Church, we love you. And uh, thank you for being here. We'll be together next week. But even if you want to join us, 7 o'clock on Thursday at Hamilton Park. This will be up, uh, the directions, every, all the details will be up on our website as well. We want to hang out with you. Just Even if you've never come or have met us in person, come. And we're just there being with one another. We have some games, we have uh, volleyball most likely, and we just want to be together, spend the summer in the park together. And so we welcome all of you to be there. We'll be there, and uh, church and visitors, we love you, and we'll see each other soon. See you next week.